Uh, it's a joy to introduce to you uh, Dr. Robbie Hamm. Uh, Robbie and Joyce are involved in um, a, a number of ministries really over in Lebanon. I don't know of anyone that has a greater passion for young children, and they have a ministry that reaches out to uh, refugee children and children who are coming from disadvantaged backgrounds and to their parents. Many of these are people coming from uh, other faiths than Christianity, and so it's a wonderful opportunity to reach out to them. So many people have become refugees in this last 10 years. We can't begin to number. Literally millions of people just coming from Syria alone. And uh, this is a window of time when many of them are coming to faith in Jesus Christ. It's something I've never, ever seen before, and it's truly remarkable. So we count it a blessing uh, to partner with Robbie and Joyce and all that they're doing there, and uh, we are looking forward to hearing from him. So now I'll ask you to stand again as our text is taken from Acts chapter 9, the story of Saul's conversion. Meanwhile, Saul was breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus so that if he found any there who belonged to the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul. Why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, he replied. Now get up and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. The men traveling with Saul stood there speechless. They heard the sound, but did not see anyone. Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand into Damascus. For three days he was blind and did not eat or drink anything. In Damascus, there was a disciple named Ananias. The Lord called to him in a vision, Ananias! Yes, Lord, he answered. The Lord told him, Go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. In a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him to restore his sight. Lord, Ananias answered, I have heard many reports about this man and all the harm he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And he has come here with authority from the chief priests to arrest all who call on your name. But the Lord said to Ananias, Go, this man is my chosen instrument to carry my name before the Gentiles and their kings and before the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. Then Ananias went to the house and entered it. Placing his hands on Saul, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here, has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately, something like scales fell from Saul's eyes, and he could see again. He got up and was baptized, and after taking some food, he regained his strength. May the Lord bless our time in his word. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Robbie Hamm. Thank you. Thank you. You may be seated. It's a pleasure for us to be here. Uh, Cornerstone holds, is near and dear to our heart. We remember Cornerstone many, many years ago, coming to general assemblies and other functions here. You are a loving, giving church. You have a missional vision, and we are honored to be partnering with you in that. Uh, our text today comes from the conversion of Saul, but the, the question I have to ask you is, wh where do we go from here? I mean, if you turn the, the news on, you look at the world outside, we are faced with unprecedented amounts of confusion and fear out there. We have wars going on, we have pandemics happening, we have an economic crisis that is sweeping the entire globe. And when we see these kind of things happening in our world around us, we have two kinds of reactions, don't we? We either fight or we flight. And oftentimes we find ourselves in church communities that the best thing to do is tuck our oars in and hope that this weather will pass and we will make it through. But the text for us this morning is more than that and God is inviting us to see something fresh and new. 
Well, several years ago, uh, the scientist by the name of Thomas Kuhn in 1962 published a seminal book called The Structures of Scientific Revolution. Now, Kuhn, as a scientist, looked at a phenomenon that was happening within the scientific community. He found that breakthroughs were prevented because people were held within a certain type of paradigm. Many years ago, I got the big idea that it would be great to go after a doctorate degree. Can somebody have sent me an email and say, uh, that is a long road, why are you doing it? My wife, she said, are you sure? But I said, yeah, let's go after this doctorate degree. And as I did, I began to understand whether you're in the social sciences or the hard sciences, you read the body of literature preceding it to understand what the body of work was there. What are they saying? What kind of new theories they're introducing? What Kuhn found in the hard sciences is that we don't make a breakthrough is because we're stuck in these old paradigms. We don't see something fresh and new. We don't understand that something on the other side is out there if we just can see it newly and freshly. In fact, what Kuhn said, he found that theories remain in place and reinforce existing paradigms until an alternative is announced. He saw problems, and he calls these anomalies. They arise when the theories can't explain the phenomenon. And what he said is what is needed is new eyeglasses to see a new paradigm. Anomalies, problems. He found that those are the niggling things that we can't answer. What, what kind of problems and anomalies are you facing in your life? What kind of situations that you are experiencing in your family, within your friends, within your work community, within your social structures that don't have answers? And oftentimes what we find ourselves doing is repeating and going back to the old paradigm because we don't necessarily see that God can do what we can't. And that is our first point I want to land ourselves this morning on. Acts chapter 9, verses 1 through 20, is a paradigm-shifting text that invites us to see that God can do what we cannot do in the world around us. What Kuhn said is that when you're experiencing this paradigm shift, he calls it a transfer of allegiance from one paradigm to a conversion experience to another. Now remind yourself, this was a scientist, this is not a theologian. And our story this morning is the conversion of Saul. On the text, it looks like Saul is on a zealous mission. He had intentionality. He knew exactly what he wanted to do, how he was going about and doing it. He had specific goals in mind to crush this new movement that was happening called the Way or Followers of Christ or the Church or something was happening. Saul said, it cannot happen. Mind you, he purged the early church. He had a track record. He was there at the stoning of Stephen. In Acts chapter 7, we find that Stephen was being stoned. And as he was being stoned, he said, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. He fell on his knees and he cried out, Lord, do not hold the sin against them. When he had said that, he fell asleep. And we find it in chapter 8, verse 1, Luke tells us that, and Saul was there approving the killing of Stephen. An old paradigm. He was there watching the death of this first apostle. Now Luke is a clever, clever master storyteller. And oftentimes when we read scriptures, we kind of go through the text, don't we? We read chapter, verse, chapter, verse. But we need context to put things into place. And Luke wants to frame this context for us. In fact, Luke writes the Gospel of Luke as well as Acts. And together, this forms this body of work, what Luke is wanting to communicate, that God can do what we can't. And how he does that is in chapter 4 of Luke, he invites us to hear the words of Jesus when he rolls out the scroll and he parks himself at Isaiah and he says these words, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news. Good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom 
for the prisoners and recovery for the sight of the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. This is in the back of the mind of the early church. The early church was experiencing the same kind of phenomenon that we are experiencing today. If you were walking around in Damascus in this century, the world out there had a tough climb around you. Challenges back then were no different then than they are today. They worshiped, the Romans worshiped the god of consumerism, wealth, sex, and violence. These were the values they held dear. What's the fascinating thing here is that the early church exponentially grew in spite of these challenges. What challenges and anomaly are you facing today? What is God asking from you? Where is God calling you? Because what happens is when we face these challenges, we want to tuck and run rather than engage the world and experiencing life as God has called us to do. Saul, here he is as a zealous, persecuting the church with full authority. He gained authority from the high priest. He was making a name for himself. Whether you're beginning your career, in the middle of your career, at the end of your career, you want to make a name for yourself. You want your body of work to speak for you. You want people to understand that this is who you are and this is the legacy that you're leaving or this is the work that you're doing. And Saul was no different because he had a purpose and an intentionality. And now he was on a mission not only from Jerusalem, now he was going to Damascus. He had purpose and goals. So what are your goals? Remember I said that Luke loves to weave various different things within his text. And if we look at the previous chapter in Acts chapter 8, we're introduced to the disciple by the name of Philip. Philip was a contemporary of Stephen. He knew Stephen. They were both set apart as apostles. And that was his friend that got stoned. And what we find is that Luke wants to compare and contrast two different disciples. He loves to do that. He loves to compare and contrast. We have on one hand Saul breathing out murderous threats, breathing out if you ever worked out and run or had some kind of vigorous exercise, you breathe out, in and out, in and out. The text is showing that he was so focused on what he wanted to do that he breathed out murderous threats. And Luke is contrasting that with the life of Philip, who was the evangelist, who went to Samaria. And mind you, within the early church, there was still debate and discussion whether we should go to Samaria or not. Is this only for us, or is this message for the rest of the world? That was the tension, the knot in the early church that they faced, the anomaly and the problem. And the Holy Spirit pushes us, moves us to show us that God can do what we can by going to the Samaritans. And remember, the Jews and the Samaritans, they, they were not friends. Those were enemies. The Samaritans were intermixed, intermarried, intermingled. We separate ourselves from them. They don't come into our area. They're over there. <laughs> we don't engage with them. We, we, we don't have relationship with those people. And yet you see within the scriptures how the Holy Spirit pushes the boundaries in our life to say, I'm going to Samaria. Philip, go to Samaria and preach the gospel. And there we're introduced as he influences the Samaritan area. And that spreads into Syria. So Luke is comparing and contrasting these two disciples or these two works going on. On one, we have Philip, which is life-giving. On the other, we have Saul, which is life-taking. Philip is grace-based. Saul is revenge-based. Philip is love Saul is hate the outsider, hauling off men and women. What is your intentionality is the question. Where do you go from here? Now we see how Saul was breathing out. He had that agenda. He got the angle, power angle worked for him by getting letters from the high priest. He secured authority and he's heading off to Damascus. And Philip, on the other hand, is showing what God is doing with love and mercy as he proclaims Jesus' people are healed, baptized, and new converts. 
And in fact, what we see in Acts chapter 8, verses 26 and 27, the text says that Philip got up and went. Now, you read those words and you go to the next verse. But Luke is intentionally placing those words because he's going to draw them out because he wants to show us that what it is about is going up, getting up, and going. So play, put that in the back of your mind for a moment. We're told that he encounters an Ethiopian official. So now, not only does he go to Samaria, which was an off-limits area, he's encountering somebody that was at the edge of the known world at the time. You see, what God is trying to say is that I respect no boundaries. I respect no political party. I respect no force. What I am about is the mission of God, which is leaving the 99 and going after the one. Ditching the 99 to say, you are my beloved. I'm going to go after you. I'm going to seek you. I'm going to go after you, and I'm going to call you to myself. That is the God we serve. And the text is trying to capture that and nuance it for us to show us what missions is all about. A God who seeks. A God who's grace-based, who's love-laced, who pours out mercy, who desires to show himself as the merciful one. We are told that this Ethiopian official is reading Isaiah chapter 56. Isaiah figures prominently within Luke. And we're told in verses 29 and 30 that Philip runs by the Spirit. And the Ethiopian man says to Philip, about whom am I reading? Who is it that I'm reading about? And Philip says these remarkable words, it, it, it's, it's Jesus. You see, from Genesis to Revelation, God is a missionary God. And you come on Mission Sunday and you tick that off the box and you sit there and you say, well, I'm not going. That preacher better not ask me to go because I'm not going to go. But we misunderstand what God is saying. It's not about distance. It's not about location. It's about your intentionality. What kind of Christian do you want to be? What kind of legacy do you want to leave behind you? Do you want to be clutching and holding on in fear because the world around us is falling apart? It does not look safe for anybody. Or do you want to engage life and live as Philip in the Spirit? You see, Isaiah chapter 43, verses 16 and 9 says it this way. This is what the Lord says. He who has made a way through the seas, a path through the mighty waters, who drew out the chariots and horses, the army and reinforcements together as they lie there, never to rise again, extinguished, snuffed out like a wick. Forget the former things. Do not dwell on the past. See, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs out. Do you not perceive it? I am making a way in the wilderness, streams in the wasteland. Saul and his companions are stuck on a paradigm. He wants to put everything back to the old way of things. In fact, what Kuhn says, the source of resistance is the assurance that old paradigms will ultimately solve the problem, and they don't. We need freshness from the Holy Spirit when we're faced with anomalies and problems in our personal life, in our marriage, in our family life. We need to dip back into the scriptures and see what God is doing in the life of Philip, comparing and contrast in the life of Saul, and say, what kind of disciple do you want to be? What direction do you want to go? In fact, Paul tells about himself. He writes the Galatians. He says, have you not heard? No doubt. Everyone knew his reputation. That in my earlier days in Judaism, I was violently persecuting the church of God, and I was trying to destroy it. I advanced in Judaism beyond any of my peers. I was so zealous for the traditions that I went on a violent rampage. You see, church, the scriptures are inviting us to say that God can do what we can't. Now, if you think missionaries, we don't experience these kind of things, the truth is we do. 
Now, Joyce and I, we run a ministry that works with at-risk communities. We see things that break the heart on a continuous basis. And if you experience that over time, you can become jaded about it. One day, we had a woman who came into our center with her little daughter. She was Kurdish from Syria. And she explained her situation to one of our staff, Nairi. We have a staff of 20 amazing women who are leading the way in early childhood development, adult mentoring, and out of that, churches flourish. People come to faith, not because of power structures, not because of articulation, but because they're showing love, mercy, care, kindness. And Muslims are saying, why do you do what you do? And they say, as Philip said, it is Jesus. Nairi brings Urena into my office. I don't know why you all do that. When you got a problem, let's call Pastor Tweedy. We're going to Pastor Tweedy. We're going to pray. I don't want to go to Pastor Tweedy. Are you going to Pastor Tweedy? We say in Arabic, which means whether you like it or not. <laughs> Urena's in my office. Now, Nairi says, Urena, what do you need? Urena says, I need a job. I need an apartment, and I need my husband who's in Turkey who wants to get to Germany to come back. I need a family. Now, why she said those three things, and Nairi began eloquently to pray, this is my conversation I had to Jesus. It's not going to happen. She's not going to get a job. She will not get a work permit. She's Kurdish, Syrian. There's no way. Tick. She's not going to get an apartment. There's no way. She was stuck in an apartment that was small, small one room with a toilet with five other families who were not her own. And I said, that's where she's going to be. Tick. And her husband, he wants to go to Germany. There's no way he wants to come back here. That's not going to happen. Nairi finishes her prayer. I think the words are so beautiful, but I said to the Lord, it's not going to happen. Now, Joyce and I, we go back and forth as we lead the project and speak at different churches. And we return back to Lebanon, and there I see Irina, and she pulls me by the suit jacket, and she said, ah, I got a job. Okay, that's great. Several months pass. I see her again, and she said, oh, I got an apartment. My daughter and I were in an apartment. That's exciting. We returned over the summer as Joyce and I worked through the summer in the project. And she said, Pastor, my husband is back. He got a work permit because he does these steel structure artisan work and they're building a huge project that his skill set was what exactly they were needing. So they brought him in, found him a visa, a work permit. And she said, I'm bringing him to your office. She brings the man into my office and he sits there like this. I don't want to be in Pastor Tweedy's office. <laughs> no. This is what she does. She takes her elbow and she throttles him in the chest. He gets thumped in the chest. He jumps back. I jump back. Now, if you're thinking out there, Muslim women, they just, oh, they're... Man, I'll tell you, have you ever seen the movie My Big Fat Greek Wedding, one of my favorites? You remember what she said, the mother said to Tula? The man may be the head, but the woman is the neck, and where she turns, the head will turn also. <laughs> And some of you ladies are going, amen to that, brother, amen to that. And this is what she said. These are the people that loved me when no one else would. She hits him again. She said, these are the people that took care of our baby girl when I was this close in my despondency to ditch and run, leave her somewhere and go. And she hits him again, and she said, these people are followers of Jesus, and so am I, and you can't take that away from me. Church, God can do what we can't. Whatever you're facing today, whatever experiencing you are going through, remind yourself that God is a God who has resurrection power and will say to your problems, they will not overcome you. Now, the second point that Luke wants to push us through is to see the world through new eyeglasses. Now, this is Reformation Sunday. Calvin, one of the great reformers, had an understanding about the Spirit illuminating the Scriptures, the Spirit co-mingling with the sacraments and taking us to a higher level. 
And the way he explains it is new eyeglasses. So I have pretty poor eyesight. So if I take my glasses off, I don't see you. I see you. I see colors you're wearing, but I cannot distinguish the features of your face. And oftentimes, you and I want to look at the world like this. Lord, I think I'm looking at it right. And what we need is the Holy Spirit to pull the eyeglasses off and for the Holy Spirit to put the eyeglasses on and for us to see a world that God wants us to bear witness to. In verse 3 of Acts chapter 9, Saul approaches Damascus and he's hit by a blinding light. And he's experiencing this blinding light encounter with the risen one who is Jesus. In fact, what Luke is hinting back to is Exodus chapter 3. Remember that? The burning bush? Moses seeing it? What does Moses do? He's curious. He goes over there. And the Lord says to Moses, he says, Moses, Moses, and he says, here am I. And what we see in this scripture verse, in verses 4 and 5, it echoes that. He, he bookmarks it back and forth, bookends, and a voice saying, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And Saul asks, who are you, Lord? And the word he uses here in the Greek is kyrios, Lord, more than just Lord, my Lord, my Lord. It's, you're shaking in your bootstraps, Lord, the risen one, and you cannot articulate what, is experience, what he's experiencing. And Jesus replies, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. Seeing the world through new eyeglasses needs a shift of intentionality. It's asking you and me, what kind of church do we want to be? What kind of Christian do we want to be? In fact, dipping into Isaiah chapter 58, verse 10, Isaiah says it this way. He says, if you pour yourself out for the hungry and satisfy the desires of the afflicted, he says, then your light shall shine in the darkness and your gloom be as the noonday. The text here is showing us what new eyeglasses in the world looks like. Saul is determined to wipe out the early church, but Jesus sees potential. Jesus sees a new paradigm for Saul. Who in your family that you have said, there's no more potential? That they're not going to go anywhere. It's not going to happen. Jesus is inviting us to see something fresh and new. Lord, you can work in their life. Lord, you can change their life. Come, Holy Spirit, convict them, show them. But what is saying about Isaiah is Isaiah is calling us to pour ourselves out. It's not merely just saying, Lord, it's action, it's intentionality, it's going to the person and saying, I'm sorry, it's going to the loved one and saying, let me heal with you, it's going and not sitting back and saying, Lord, you go and you do, I'll just sit back here. And then you wonder why no action and movement is happening because the younger generation is looking at the church and they are not seeing the fruit that they want to see because we're not consistent in showing mercy and grace and love and calling people who are broken and wounded to say, come and receive healing. In fact, Dana Outland in his book, In Gentle and Lowly, writes the following. Jesus does not love like us. We love until we are betrayed. Jesus continues to the cross despite betrayal. We love until we are forsaken. Jesus loved through forsakenness. We loved up unto a limit. Jesus loves up until the end. New eyeglasses recognize that God is a merciful God, a forgiving God, a God who calls us to repent of our sins and strive to live as followers of Christ. Remember how I said Luke wants to introduce these nuanced themes within his text. So if you're a careful reader of the gospel, you're going to remember the story of Luke chapter 8 with the woman with the issue of blood. She had no hope. 
she took all of her life savings and spent it on trying to get healed. And she pushes through the anomalies, the crowd, the obstacles, and she clutches out the hem of his garment. And Jesus says, somebody touched me. And his disciples say, what paradigm are you on? The crowd is pressing in. <laughs> You're crazy. Everybody is touching you. And he says, no, somebody touched me. And what Luke is saying in that beautiful story is that the only way to see life with new eyeglasses, the only way to see that God can do what we can is clutching at the hem of his garment holding on to say, you are the only one I've got. You are the only one. Regardless of what you've done or who you are, God wants to use you. When I travel around and I talk to people, you'll sit there and go, well, yeah, you missionaries, you go. God bless you, here's a check. And I look at the check and go, that's it? <laughs> I'm joking. I'm choking. I'm choking. <laughs> the issue here is perfectionism. You think you don't have it. You think, I don't, I don't have the stuff. I, you, Lord knows what I'm moving through. Lord knows me. Throughout the scriptures, when it talks about perfectionism, it's not talking about this perfection that you'll never attain. It's talking about wholeness. And as we think about Reformation Sunday, Martin Luther said it this way, simul justice et precator. Simul, where we get the word simultaneous. Justice, justice, where we get the word justice and we get the word righteous. Et, where we get the word, the past tense, to eat. He et this dinner yesterday. No, that's not it. That is for you Latin people out there. It's and. A too, Brutai, and you as well, Brutus. And precator, sinful, what Luther was saying, simultaneously righteous and a sinner. Don't let it hold you back. Don't let life pass before you and let it go because you disqualified yourself and said, I can't. God can what you can't. And he invites you to see yourself afresh and the mission of God afresh, doing something wonderful and new. The third point I want to leave you with is the concept of get up and go. Remember I told you to file in the back of your head certain words? So when you read the scriptures, you'll read those words and you'll pass by them. Because you're, you're, you're reading, you're just reading the text. But remember when Philip was being led by the Holy Spirit in verse 6 of chapter 8? God tells Philip to go. And I'm sorry, in verse 6 now, he tells Saul, what does he say in verse 6 of chapter 9? He says, get up and enter the city, and you will be told what you are to do. He tells Saul to get up and go. He tells Philip to go. And Luke is weaving in this theme about what does it mean to be a follower of Christ in the mission of God. You see, church, because what the mission of God is is not one Sunday a year. You tick it off and it's over. It is the lifestyle of our God. From Genesis to Revelation, He is a missionary God and He invites us to live a life with new glasses to read the text to say He's a reaching out God. He's a God who loves the lost. He's a God that heals us and saves us and invites us to go and follow after him. We're told that Saul pushes himself out from the ground, and he's blind. He can't see a thing. And for three days, his companions take him into Damascus, and he can't eat or drink because he is blind, and he has scales that are on his eyes. Now, remember how I said that Luke loves to compare and contrast, right? He's introducing us to another disciple by the name of Ananias. First, we were introduced to Stephen, his compatriot, Philip. We are shown and seen the lifestyle of these disciples. Blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are the pure in heart. Do you see that? What they're demonstrating? 
And then we're introduced to Saul and his demonstration of his intentionality, of his mission, of destroying and hating and clutching and killing. And Luke compares and contrasts these. And now he introduces us to Ananias in verse 13. And the Lord says to Ananias, go. And Ananias says, Lord, I have heard about this man and how much evil he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. Ananias has a good argument. I'm with him. I'm not going to go. You go. But God tells us, see the world newly, that he can do what we can't. And he tells Ananias to go. And he tells them about Saul and Saul's calling. And he says these words in verse 15. Look with me. See that word go? For he is an instrument, Jesus says, to bring my name before Gentiles and kings and to before the people of Israel. Both are asked to get up and go. Both are going. And what Luke is doing is that he's dipping back into Genesis chapter 12. That's how clever Luke is. That's how rich the scriptures are. He dips back into Luke, Genesis chapter 12, where the gospel is starting right there when God calls Abraham. And what does he say to Abraham? He says, go from your country, from your people, from your father, from your household, from your land, that I will show you why. Because it's a frame of reference. It's a paradigm to say, we are aliens in this world. This is not our resting place. And if it was a resting place, we live differently. But as followers of Christ, we are passing through. So your wealth that you have is passing through. Your resources you have is passing through. Your family that you have, you're passing through. What legacy? What do you want to leave? God says to Abraham, I'm going to make you great. You're going to be a blessing. Those who bless you, I will bless. And whoever will curse you, I will curse. And he says, all the peoples on the earth will be blessed. We're seeing the blessing right here. That fulfillment. You're sitting in the fulfillment that God said in Genesis chapter 12. We had one staff member who worked for us. Uh, Her name was Safa. And she was a Muslim woman. And she started with us. She was our cook. And we knew she had a difficult marriage situation. Uh, Her husband wasn't kind to her at all. And as Savat got to know us and who we are and saw what we were doing, she became intrigued about who this person is, Jesus. And over time, we don't know when, Safat started calling herself, I'm a follower of Jesus. I love Jesus. And her husband wasn't happy about that at all. One day, I I go into the kitchen, and she has dark sunglasses on. And I'm really slow on the uptake. But she pulls those off, and I see why she's holding those dark sunglasses. Over time, Safa has the courage to say, enough. Now, in Islamic court, she doesn't have the right to divorce her husband. So she takes her kids, and she runs away from him. And he breathes out murderous threats, comes to my office breathing out murderous threats. Where is she? What did you do? I did not know where she was. I heard about Safa because she went into hiding. I heard that eventually he found her and he took her children and took them back to Syria. She has no rights. She lost her children. I lost touch with Safa and recently I saw her at a conference, and there she was, and she came up to me and she said, Pastor, you know my story. I still don't have my children. I don't know where they are. She said, God gave me a a new husband, a follower of Jesus from a Muslim background. Here he is. I meet him. His name is Muhammad. And Safa says, I'm going to Syria to preach the gospel. You see, church, God calls us to give up and go. 
No matter what you face in life, following Jesus gives us the opportunity to get up and go. So today I leave with you an understanding of what God is doing in the mission of the world today. He is saving people. He invites you to participate in the life that he is doing. And that means you need to move beyond your paradigms to clutch at the hem of his garment. And Paul says it this way in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. We are hard pressed on every side, but we are not crushed. We're perplexed, but we are not in despair. We are persecuted, but not abandoned. We are struck down, but not destroyed. We always carry around in the body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may be revealed in our body. May the Lord bless the preaching of his word.